So just to start out, hi everybody out there. Uh, nice to see everyone again. This is the first webinar of the fall for uh, for Iris. And uh, just so you know, this is Andy Forsetto. I'm broadcasting live from the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology headquarters in Washington, DC. If you're not familiar with these, uh, with IRIS, uh, we're about a 30 year old consortium of universities and a science facility that's supported by the National Science Foundation to operate programs that enable a broad spectrum of geophysical research. If you don't know me personally, I'm uh, a technically a project associate. I like to refer to myself as a Swiss Army knife who helps manage uh, EarthScope's US Array program, as well as the Global Seismic Network and some of the other instrumentation and uh, community engagement programs, specifically in seismology that are run by IRIS. The webinars started in mid 2011 and are developed to highlight uh, the science or the research resources that are either directly or indirectly enabled by IRIS. And if you're interested in looking back at some of the previous ones that we've broadcast, they are archived uh, both off of a website uh, that I have up, on, up here on the screen, iris.edu slash HQ slash webinar, you can scroll through. We're gonna work on revamping this page soon so it's a little more sortable because we've got so many webinars that they just sort of go on and on. Uh, and then we have a list of upcoming webinars at the top uh, that you can look forward to. And uh, if YouTube's more your flavor, uh, if you click on one of these, it'll go directly to the YouTube file and you can also browse them along with a lot of other educational content on the Iris ENO YouTube page. So just an outline of how the webinars work. Uh, so only the speaker and I are going to have voices, uh, Alex Sutko, who is our speaker, and myself. If you have a question that comes up as the webinar is unfolding, then uh, what I would like you to do is just concisely and clearly type that into the question box that's on the webinar control panel that's sort of floating on your desktop. At the end, I will browse through all those questions and I will read your name and the question that you've asked to the speaker so they know where that question is coming from. And uh, if I have more than one of the same kind of question, I'll probably just take the first one in order that I get to uh, and then not ask any duplicates just to save time. Uh, if the webinar implodes, this has only happened once, then I will reboot it on our end. And uh, all you'd need to do is just wait a couple minutes and click the link that you got when you registered for the webinar. Uh, and then that should bring it right back up like nothing happened. Uh, I'm recording this, both the presentation and the questions, and then that's going to be available, uh, as I introduced at the outset, uh, to watch later, or uh, either going back to look at it if there was something that you missed, or if you know somebody who'd be interested in the content, you can always refer that to them. And we'll generally get that up within the next day or two after we're finished this afternoon. Uh, also, this is more for my benefit, just uh, record keeping. But if you're watching this with a group of people, I know that uh, some people use that as like their our weekly group meeting when we have a webinar. Uh, please let me know how many folks are in the room with you. Uh, just helps to know how, how many people this is reaching. Uh, and yeah, I think that for introduction, I think that's all I want to go through. So uh, let me introduce our speaker. Our speaker today is actually a coworker of mine at IRIS in our uh, Seattle, Washington office versus Washington, DC. Uh, so it's Dr. Alex Hutko. He is a product specialist at the IRIS Data Management Center, which is in Seattle. Alex received his PhD at UC Santa Cruz, and he was also a Mendenhall postdoc at the USGS National Earthquake Information Center in Golden, Colorado. And he joined IRIS uh, in March 2010, just a couple of days after the Malay earthquake. Uh, he pointed that to me. So uh, I can just say that as one of Alex's coworkers, I know that we're really fortunate to have him as part of the team. Uh, and some of the work that he's going to introduce today, I think, speaks to that. So without further ado, uh, I will switch it over to Alex to present on Iris Data Products. And let me just uh, switch presentation mode. So uh, Alex, your audio is going to take a second to pick up. So here we go. Okay, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Echo. I'm at the IRIS DMC, and this is our third or fourth year doing um, data products. And I hope to breeze through these. Um, I don't have an audience to engage in, but just send any questions. And I just want to give sort of like a highlight of what we're doing, and hopefully you'll see some interesting things 
Um, officially, uh, we're ruled by the data products working group. We're for the research community, sort of by the research community. Um, unofficially, we're just trying to do things that facilitate research, whatever that means. That's a very broad definition. But we're always looking for feedback, new ideas, and collaborations. Um, Everything that we do is approved by the Data Products Working Group, so it's vetted by them. Before we release it, they also review things. Um, but before I start, um, I would, it would be remiss of me not to mention web services. So most people out there listening to this are still probably using breakfast requests to get data. That breakfast will, will always be supported by Iris, and it works well. However, um, web services really is easy, and it sounds fancy and difficult when you first get acquainted to it, but it's actually quite easy. And I'll just walk you through a very quick example. Um, if you just want to say get uh, BHC data from GSN stations from 30 to 90 degrees for the Tohoku earthquake, all you do is you type in, you download the fetch data Perl script, which runs on most platforms natively. You just type this command in right there. Uh, if you leave a field blank, so for example, there is no minus capital S for station, if you leave a blank, that's a wildcard. Um, you just have to download a meta file, the mini seed file, and if you want the SAC pull zero file or the response file, you can do that with minus RD or minus SD. You just do a mini seed to SAC. We also have that software on our web page. Um, and then it spits out your SAC files. And in this case, downloading um, something like, I don't know, 80 or 90 seismograms took only 7.9 seconds. So um, it's definitely something you should uh, consider. We also have um, this script fetch event, which scans through earthquake catalogs quite uh, quickly, and it also has a very nice, neat output. Uh, you can search by depth, by distance, by sort of radius or donuts of distances. Um, you can also search different catalogs, the PDE, GCMT catalog. Excuse me. Um, as you can see, the format's quite easily parsable. Um, and if you want uh, any more information on how to get data using the fetch scripts, uh, my colleague Celso Reyes did a whole webinar on that um, exact topic. There's also ways to import data directly into MATLAB. That's a good webinar if you want to watch that. But let's jump right into products. So we have three flavors of products that we've that we supply right now. We have ones that we develop totally in-house ones that are contributed to us, and we modify the scripts. We set them up for fully automated processing. We run them on our machines. And ones that are uh, collaborations as well, where somebody has written a grant to a competitive process that is reviewed, and the DPWG chooses who to fund. Those grants are, in the past have been up to 25000 um, and we hope to continue that in the future, but we can't say for certain whether that happen or not. Um, but I'm going to breeze through most of these. Uh, the ones that we've developed wholly in-house are the Earth Model Collaboration, where you can sort of make your own demography models. The Event Plots, which is a suite of seismograms following all earthquakes that's automatically generated. The Ground Motion Visualizations, many of you have probably seen, are these pretty movies uh, showing the seismic wave field sweep across the US array. The back projections show the rupture imaging from large earthquakes. That funny looking symbol thing is our infrasound symbol. We need to come up with something better. But we also have um, PDFs available from uh, via breakfast request. The ones that have been contributed externally is the shear wave splitting database. We're actually a mirror for the uh, French site that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, EARS, which came out of the University of South Carolina. Uh, the University of Washington is working with this on uh, calculating a large series of envelope functions. That's in the very early stages, but right now it seems as if um, they're calculating envelopes for the GSN and denser, smaller networks like uh, the UW network. Um, the Global Shake Movie Synthetics are the spectral element synthetics coming out of Princeton. We actually have those in our archive and they're very easy to access. We also uh, have the, the same information as the GCMT website. We're just pulling that directly and you can that feeds into our products, and you can get that from our fetch event script as well. Um, and we also have uh, working with Anna Calbert and some Oregon people on magnetic transfer functions. Uh, 
we also have empirical Green's functions calculated via uh, cross-correlation from a massive uh, couple of gigabyte database um, put together by the Colorado group. SciSound, I'll show you later, there's some neat examples of that. I'll show you a neat example of the earthquake energy and rupture duration. Um, Emerald is a package out of ASU, which is pretty neat for viewing data and manipulating it and you know, setting up record sections and such like that. Okay, so the primary portal for the majority of our data, and certainly for all of the event-based products, is SPUD. SPUD is actually a database, but you can just think of it as a website. It's a it's an intuitive website that just works, and it's kind of almost one-stop shopping for all things um, event-related in products world. Um, so it has this really easy and simple to use intuitive interface. There's a Google map. You can just draw it. I drew this around the Pakistani event recently. Um, there's very simple controls for magnitude, depth of event, start times, and such. Uh, this is the event-based query. So what happens when you click on this is it'll take you to this page, which shows all the products that have been automatically generated for this event. Um, and these usually get uh, generated within an hour to a few hours after origin time, and they're fully automated, so even if nobody's attending to them, they show up on the web magically. So um, we're going to just jump right into the ground motion visualizations. A lot of you guys have probably seen this, but what my colleague Manush and I did this morning is we uh, combined a really neat um, set of GMVs. These are from the Sea of Okhotsk event, um, which is a fun word to say. It was, a, it was the biggest deep earthquake. Um, this is the GMV from this event. On the left is the vertical component, and on the right is um, the wheat field version, which is the horizontal components. Um, that's the P wave coming in, and then you're going to see the S waves, and then um, you'll see the surface waves, and then later you'll see the uh, Great Arc Path coming from the southeast going up to the Great Lakes. But we're actually going to get to a much cooler version of this later, so I'm just going to go ahead and skip that. But these are uh, quite popular, especially for following large earthquakes for ENO purposes. Um, so probably one of the biggest products in terms of numbers of things that it offers is the event plots, which is up to 80 figures generated after each earthquake uh, greater than magnitude. Um, I think the threshold we have is 5.5. Um, and Within each, there's many different galleries. So, for example, in the first gallery, there's maps. In the second gallery, there's global surface wave and body wave record sections. And within each gallery, it's sort of like at popular websites like Huffington Post or whatever, you can just click on one of the images and then use your uh, right and left arrow key and scroll through the images very quickly. So, um, there are of order 40 or 50 record sections produced for each event, or at least attempted. If there aren't enough data, it won't produce a record section. But these are examples of clean record sections. Um, there are surface wave record sections using GSN data. There's body wave record sections using all broadband data available to IRIS. That is all BH data. Um, I rotate the data into the, the horizontals into the radial and transverse. There's vertical. Um, travel time curves are always provided in a sort of similar image, so there's always the naked image and then an image with travel time curves to help with uh, phase identification. Uh, there's, I think, up to four different frequency bands, so if you're uh, in love with a particular phase, you can find the one figure that you like. Uh, and there's also ones that are aligned on the P wave from 0 to 90 degrees, but also from 0 to 180 degrees where they get aligned on P, P diff, and then PKP phases. So those are straight-up record sections, and then this is something that's slightly a little bit more processed. What it does is it creates virtual arrays. So where it, what it, in this particular case, what it does is it looks for the median location of all of the United States stations, which is going to be in the middle of USRA, and then it creates, I think, uh, either a 5 or 10 degree uh, circle around that and captures all stations within that, which is usually USRA. And then with those 400 or so stations, it calculates a multi-channel cross-correlation uh, aligned on the P wave. And what you're seeing right now is the shifted and aligned record section that you get um, following this procedure for one particular event. 
um, plotted also here are the cross correlation coefficient. As you can see, it's a very well it's an impulsive event. The cross correlation coefficients are high, but also um, the residuals with respect to the mean. Um, and these residuals with respect to the mean, you can think of as sort of tra average travel time delays. And these are actually available in SPUD through that big web page um, toward the bottom uh, as attachments and text files. And they're also bundled in a zip file, if you like. So one of the things we want, um, we're, we want to facilitate research, and one of the ways we want to do this is to sort of facilitate data mining. So we've created uh, event plots for thousands of events. Well, uh, I think it was maybe a year or two ago, I took all of these text files that were produced from the multi-channel cross-correlations for TA data, and I simply averaged them. So wherever there was a station, I took all that information, I fed it in, and this is the result. This is the average delay. Um, based on hundreds of multi-channel cross-correlations from hundreds of events from all over the world at all distances. And then this is something that I made with the uh, EMC, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, and as you can see, it, it replicates the tomography model actually pretty well. The, the major feature is this, this little streak here, uh, this little hotspot right there. So, and this is just simple travel time delays based on the cross-correlation algorithm. So, I show this as an example of there are a lot of, uh, we haven't made it public yet, but there are ways to access um, systematically and programmatically uh, every single text file, for example, that gives you the travel time residuals. So if you guys have ideas out there on uh, how to mine these data, please let us know, and maybe we can facilitate some of these or take those into account and set something up for future reference. Um, going back to the virtual race that I was just talking about, uh, you have everything aligned, but uh, you can also, once you have data in a relatively small region, um, and when they're shifted and aligned to have a common P wave arrival relative to the reference model you're using, then you can calculate vespergrams. So vespergrams, this is you can this is just time right here, and then these are just stacks in slowness space, which means you're just shifting it based on a distance relative to the center point of your array, for example. Um, this is a very common technique in the nuke monitoring community where they use small uh, IMS arrays. But in this case, I'm using uh, sort of continental scale and regional scale arrays to do the same thing. But as you can see, there's, there's uh, here, you can see the PE wave coming in. This guy is PP. Um, and there are times, uh, like out here, you can actually see P prime, P prime, or excuse me, um, that's a core phase there. But there's a movie that I'll hope to get to later that shows a lot of the evolution of the, the Vespergrams, which is pretty neat. Um, and the final gallery in the event plots is the P coda stack. So what I do is I collect all the data, I distance, I bin them according to distances, I calculate the envelopes, and then I stack those envelopes, and this is what you get. They're lined on the P wave. This gold line is the predicted uh, travel time arrival for PCP. This is little p, big P. Uh, this is little s, big P. And this is PP. And for this case, and for this particular event, you can see that um, the little s, big P travel time is matched well here. But then you have this arrival here, which does not have the same move out. And in fact, it has the same move out as the uh, original P wave arrival, which suggests that this was uh, a double earthquake, where there's two earthquakes separated by about 150 seconds in the same location. So <clears throat> now I'm going to move on to uh, the back projections. Um, this is where I spent the majority of the last year or two of my thesis um, in my postdoc. Uh, and I was happy to bring it here. Now, there's been a lot of evolution in the back projection world. Um, there's fancier techniques out there. Some of you are familiar with you know, the music technique, the compressive sensing. Um, but what I really like about these back projections that we have set up at IRIS is that um, they're fully automated and it's a standardized data set. Like it's completely blind, there's no human input, and it's a decent first cut. Um, and it, and within, so what I do is I split up the Earth into, there are four arrays that I try to attempt to calculate back projections for if the event is in an appropriate distance. Australia, Europe, North America, and the GSN. 
and in this case for the winter one earthquake I'm just showing you the results from the North American array. Um, these are the aligned seismograms, these are the unfiltered and filtered versions, and this is the back projection moving, and it is the time history where there is constructively constructive interference which you assume is coming from the rupture front or excuse me where the majority of moment is getting released that is where you're going to have the majority of coherence and this is a coherence enhancing technique so as you saw the event started out by the hypocenter and then it propagated to the northeast um, and these red dots show up when the absolute value of the stack amplitudes is so low but just to keep track of where things are going on you have that dot um, and these colored dots over here sort of also represent um, where the peak amplitude was at different times so it tracks the location of these uh, local maxima so there was this interesting event um, yesterday in Pakistan uh, it was a 7.8 it was also a strike slip like the Wenchuan earthquake um, the finite fault modeling, some of you may have seen it, that it was released from the USGS, at least the first version, propagated mostly to the northeast, but as you'll see here, it's going to start out at the origin, and these, are, these four panels are four different arrays, but what you want to see in the back projection is sort of consistency. So if you see um, the same features showing up at the same location and time at different arrays, which are using data from different azimuths, that usually is an indication of robustness of features. However, there are a lot of um, limitations with back projection. For example, uh, depth phases will often uh, cause a lot of interference and sort of swimming direction, swimming of artifacts in the direction of the arrays. But if we watch this again, um, it starts off around here. This is a particularly good one. It starts off around here, but then around 50 seconds later, you'll see something to the southwest. And you also see it in uh, the North American back projections. So for some reason, the back projections suggest there is some activity to the southwest. Uh, I won't make that interpretation because we don't do research at IRIS. We simply facilitate it. OK, now we're just going to skip along to the next project, which is uh, Earthquake Rup Energy and Rupture Duration, which is a collaborative project that came out of Georgia Tech. So some of you are familiar with the work that Jaime Converse and Andy Newman are doing there. They have, uh, this is, they basically gave us their codes. Uh, however, I will point out that one difference between the results on our page and their page is uh, our results go all the way back to 1990. Um, they're fully consistent with each other, so it's the same set of scripts running everything. And also, we're, we're always using the Fulcrum mechanism, which can sometimes make a difference. So the system that they have running, oftentimes they don't take into account the Fulcrum mechanism, which can sometimes underestimate uh, energy. So uh, the basis of the method is um, if you have a source, in this case it's a boxcar source, uh, if you integrate the energy, the energy, this is assuming point sources, these point sources have an assumed decay of energy. If you sum that, integrate it with time, uh, you have this red curve. And at the intersection of this line where it's grow the energy is growing, and the intersection of this dashed line where it is falling off to the background noise is the rupture duration. So for the Pakistani event, um, this is the result of, uh, of the method. Um, 100 seconds is probably quite a bit long uh, for magnitude 7.7, .7, but um, for shallow events, you can get a lot of excuse me, reverberations as well as um, converted phases in the crust, which sometimes extends things to make them appear a bit longer. But uh, earthquake energy is used as a proxy f sometimes for measuring, comparing it with the moment magnitude to look at, uh, look for tsunami earthquakes. And it's also a rich data set that's uh, ripe for mining. I think we calculate this for every magnitude six and greater earthquakes since 1990. So there's 3,000 of them in there right now. And the location is um, spud beta. Uh, we put it in beta just to emphasize that it's still in progress and it's not um, finalized yet. Um, so we also have uh, an infrasound, two infrasound products. Uh, a few years ago, they started piggybacking uh, memes. Uh, I don't know what the acronym stands for. Uh, basically, it measures barometric pressure uh, for at every seismic station now. Um, 
So we've taken advantage of that and we do two things. We create record sections for known events like um, rocket launches or bolides or meteorites or uh, oftentimes uh, like explosions that you'll see in the news. Um, and we also have a automatic detector that goes on. So for the um, Oh, so this is a, an example of a record section from um, one of the SpaceX rockets, which launched from Florida, had a very clear record section, it produced a clear signal across US array. Um, so this is the BDF channel, which is a infrasound channel. Um, we also produce equivalent record sections using seismic channels, which uh, tend not to have as clear of a signal in this case. Um, but we have an entire database. Uh, and the, I think the statistics are here where you can see there's uh, many different phenomena that produce those. And if you have any contributions or if you happen to be in the infrasound world and you'd like to, uh, if you're running your own detectors and you'd like to consider uh, contributing them to this, I uh, would welcome that. And we also run a, uh, what we call TAID. It's, um, it's an automated detector. It's basically a signal or noise ratio based detector. We run it for all US array stations and these there you can see things in two different ways. One is a, a Google map where you can uh, in this case this was uh, you can make a movie of detections and detections are where the signal to noise ratio exceeds some background threshold. And in this case during this day there was an explosion in Louisiana which made the news. Uh, and it was quite tragic. However, it uh, sort of lit up the U.S. array, and it didn't light it up necessarily in absolute sense, but in a relative sense, relative to the background. Uh, and just as a validation that the method is is doing quite well, detections. Um, this is a histogram uh, using days of the week. So as you can see, um, due to cultural noise, things are quite quiet from say midnight to 6 a.m. and then pick up around uh, noontime. It's really loud, and on the weekends, things tend to be quiet. So this is another example of one of these data sets that we have just sitting there that's ripe for mining. Um, we're backfilling this, so we intend to backfill this for to have at least three years of data um, at every USRA station. So there's been a couple uh, really interesting events in the past few years um, that have galvanized the community or at least a lot of people, uh, for example, following the Tohoku event, were posting their own research results on their Facebook pages, and it was a bit of a scramble with people emailing each other. Well, we decided it would be nice if we could sort of serve as a landing spot for informal and preliminary results, not necessarily for the public, but sort of for, re for scientists, research scientists by research scientists. So uh, we did this for three events so far, the Tohoku event, the North Korean nuclear test in 2013, and the recent Russian bolide last year, or this past February. Um, so in each event, in each uh, special events page, there is a summary. There are links that people can contribute. So if there is another Tohoku event, um, we will set one of these pages up at the bottom. There is a discussion and comments where you can simply email product at IRIS and we will put up your link to your own personal research page. Uh, it doesn't have to be formal, but we're just trying to get results and collect information as quickly as we can if, to facilitate researchers. Uh, if people want to give us their images directly, so some of these I actually stole off Facebook, but this is one image for the North Korean event that I just made myself. I simply took data from MDJ and overlaid it from the 2013 and 20, 2009 event, and uh, they overlaid nearly perfectly, suggesting a, a very close location between the two. Um, this was uh, something that Zagong Peng put on his uh, Facebook page, for example, that I just ripped off, and I asked him permission to put it on our page, and it's just uh, comparing the North Korean uh, recordings of the North Korean ex test versus the bolide at similar distances at different frequencies. 
you know, since that's sort of the neat plot. And then, um, as you can see, at, toward the bottom here, uh, there's a section for comments and discussions. And then also, uh, I made just a little relocation exercise that I put up on there. So this is sort of a clearinghouse for links in formal research, um, if you want to put exercises. Uh, sort of just think of the things that people tend to email after large events or put on their Facebook, um, just to make it a little bit more uh, accessible. Um, Jumping to the next product, the EMC, the Earth Model Collaboration. Um, so far, uh, 23, we've had uh, 23 contributions from the research community where people have given us their tomography model. And what we do is we take it, we ingest it, and we uh, convert it to NetCDF for our own internal purposes. So you can either download these models yourself in their original format or in the NetCDF format that they that they have either created themselves or that we've created. And we certainly encourage any tomographers or Earth models out there that aren't necessarily tomography, seismic velocities, uh, um, to contribute. Um, one of the neat things about it is uh, you don't have to rely on your um, grad students or advisor to make images or your colleague who's a GMT whiz. You can just go to our web page and spend a minute and make your own images. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of different reference models. Uh, we have a lot of, we have 23 contributed models. Uh, and I'm just going to go through some examples of how you can make uh, these images yourself and what kind of images you can make. So with some of the images, so for example, like a map view image, uh, you can add things like focal mechanisms. You can add uh, contours from slab 1.0, uh, volcano locations, plate boundaries. Uh, yeah, so this is an example of just making a map. There is a Google map interface, or you can input the lat long in a box if you want. Uh, there's a drop down menu for you to choose one of the 23 models. Uh, you can choose whatever depth slice you want to make it in. You can choose your color palette. You can choose the range of colors. Um, you can choose how many focal mechanisms you want to put in there. Uh, and the neat thing about this is it'll, it'll make the image for you, and it'll just appear on the website there within a few seconds. Uh, but also, it'll allow you to download the bundle, which has the GMT script that we actually ran for you. So it's a good way to learn GMT. Uh, we also have these nice slice stacks where you can either go through different depth slices for the same model, or you can go through the different the same depth at different models or any combination thereof it's very intuitive and simple uh, there's a cross section where again uh, you can put in the lat long coordinates or you can simply uh, pick up and drop these Google pins uh, major boundaries are plotted there you can um, exaggerate the topography as much as you like Uh, and then we have basically the same thing, except uh, you can have multiple uh, cross sections laying right next to each other. There is also velocity trends. So you, you can either have uh, a depth profile. We call this a depth profile, basically, where you just plot the absolute velocity through the model. But you can also plot um, relative perturbations through the model at whatever point you choose, whether it's the same point through different models or different points through different models. So it's quite flexible and it's very easy. Uh, I'll skip over to the next product now, the uh, noise toolkit. This is something that's in development. So uh, we hope that this has a lot of potential for ripe data mining, especially from now that uh, there's a lot of interest in using seismic data to study climate, weather, microseisms. Um, and this basically is based on two things. We, t we take uh, every hour we calculate. Uh, we take the PDFs every hour. And in half hour overlapping moving bins, we calculate uh, PDFs. And yeah, I'll just jump right in. So this was contributed by the Utah group. Um, it's a polarization analysis. And each of these nine is uh, labeled here. So for example, it's the vertical power, the power on the east-west component. Um, they break it down into the eigenvalues. And this is the power on the principal eigenvalue. Uh, 
you can read through these. Um, but so it, our philosophy for this is we will calculate it for you. We're the data center, and we haven't uh, figured out yet how we're going to distribute these, but uh, we certainly welcome ideas. But basically, we will have these. We will calculate them, and we're hoping that you, the community, will uh, mine these and extract some useful information out of them. The other part of the uh, noise toolkit is um, is this, uh, excuse me, oh, it's the microseism index, right? So my colleague Manoush has worked on this, and what you're seeing here is uh, in this panel right here is the wind speed. So this is the average wind speed in red, and this is the maximum speed of wind gusts as the dots. Uh, the top is the infrasound detection rate for the TA, in this case, it's just a TA station. Um, so major storms are shown. So for example, here you can see uh, Hurricane Sandy sort of lit things up. Uh, in the third panel down here is the uh, primary microseism. So this is uh, filtered around 16 seconds. Down here is the secondary microseism filtered around seven seconds. And again, you can see activity picked up uh, when Hurricane Sandy rolled by. All right, um, so these are, uh, the next thing is the global stacks, which is um, sort of a, a fun to do project. This is sort of an update of this poster that many seismology groups have hanging in their hallways. I thought it'd be fun to update this um, since we have um, about an order of magnitude, actually it's something like 20 times more usable data for this type uh, analysis. So I tried to download as much data as I could, and how did I do that? I downloaded 90 minutes of continuous waveforms from all 5.7 or greater events. Um, I excluded events that had an event that is approximately as large or larger if it was within an hour. Uh, I did a lot of QCing where I threw a sp uh, spiky or gappy data. Uh, and I want to emphasize that um, these data were filtered in many different frequency bands and then they were uh, QC'd for a signal to noise ratio of the P wave or the S wave or PP within each frequency band. So the remaining data set after all that um, QCing is two terabytes, two million traces, but not all of them get used. And so let's just start out by saying, uh, you know, there's I think there was something, there was hundreds of events and thousands of stations used, which has a combination of a million seismograms. What I do is I take the data and I bin them into very narrow distance bins of half a degree wide. So in this case, there's many more than 80 seismograms. I just happen to plot the first 80 trace numbers. I filter the data in different frequency bands. Uh, again, they're QC'd within each frequency band. I uh, calculate the envelopes of the cold data set, uh, and then I stack the envelopes. And then, so, and this is one example. So this is just one particular distance right here that's being shown. I will take all these envelopes, I will add them up, sum them nonlinearly, and that'll produce this one trace, which I've uh, converted the, from a wiggle plot into a color plot. And then you repeat that exercise for each of the 360 bins. And this is what you get. This is just a simple envelope stack. As you can see, it's totally dominated by the P wave as expected. But in order to enhance this, uh, we can do it, we can enhance the image and smooth it a bit by subtracting the bin median. And then we can further enhance things, um, not by plotting the envelopes, but by doing an STA LTA, so a short term average, long term average function on the envelopes themselves. So as you can see, and also I would like to add that. Um, you don't want the P wave to dominate things, so you have to saturate things. And in this case, I think I chose to saturate it at a STA LTA of 25, which is why that you, you don't see a very particularly strong P wave. The P wave is there, but there's so many other uh, stuff going on that has STA LTAs uh, of 25 as well. But when you use the power of numbers, you get a really pretty image. So this is the first cut image. As expected, it's totally dominated, dominated by the P wave. When you apply n root stacking, you certainly clean things up and you start to enhance later weaker phases. 
and then you can further enhance things by applying automatic game control. And this is the ooh and ah image. So uh, in this case, uh, you can see the band. I, I happen to choose a window of 360 seconds, and that's kind of determining this width that you see around all of these major phases. So for this particular sack, you can see the histogram of data down here. Um, for 90 degrees distance where you expect to see the most data, there's up to 5,000 traces. And this whole image was made with over 700,000 seismograms, which all passed QSYNC for this particular frequency band. Um, mirroring that image and going all the way up to 360 produces this. So it's, it's really cool to see, uh, you know, this is PP, this is triple P, quad P. Uh, yeah, any of these flat phases that you see, if it's a flat phase, it means it has a near normal incident, meaning indicating that it took at least one or many trips through the core. For example, um, oh, maybe we'll get to that later, but uh, I just want to say this is one, this is an image at one frequency. I, calc I did the same process for many different frequencies, and now we're going to sweep through in a movie many different frequencies, and you'll see that dispersion is clearly visible. So this is a very high frequency stack. It's centered, the, it's filtered around one second. We're going to sweep the lower and lower frequencies. And as we go to lower frequencies, you'll see the surface waves start to dominate, and you'll also see the surface waves start to get uh, faster. So, you know, originally it had a, it was up here, and then you can see the slope decrease, indicating it got faster. So that's that's a fun movie to watch. And one thing that I find particularly interesting is these core phases, uh, these late core phases. They're, they tend to be strongest right around eight seconds. Uh, so I, it's up to researchers, I think, to I think it'd be interesting uh, to look why they're not as strong at around one second. It's probably a coherency issue, no doubt. But uh, they appear to be strongest at around eight seconds. So this phase right here, which has been seen in many different studies, is uh, PKP, 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 triple, triple P prime. Uh, but what is cool and what's quite prominent is this guy right here, which is, um, I'm not going to say that, it's just 4P prime. Uh, and there actually was a paper um, in 1960 by Beno Gutenberg uh, claiming to see that, but <laughs> this, is, uh, this is his observations. Uh, and perhaps in context of the entire seismogram, it had a more apparent image, but um, you can't really see it here. Although I was talking to Paul Richards at AGU, and he did say that um, he did see 4P prime from uh, following one of the uh, large Russian nuclear tests. But in any case, um, I excuse me. I think it's um, I think it's quite impressive that you can see it uh, for such a distance range. I mean, it's from 80 degrees to possibly even 150 degrees. Um, so anyway, this is this is Seismology Exotica. Uh, we're making the observations, we're putting this out there, and hopefully somebody can um, find this useful. If not, find it pretty. So this is uh, another fun phase. This is ripped off of Edgar Narrow's website. Um, this is where uh, PCP and P4KP have uh, at certain distances they have very similar paths through the mantle, but uh, the P4 KP takes uh, an extra bunch of trips through the core. So um, if when we're inclined to study properties of the outermost outer core, this would be a, a good phase to look at. I think it's appearing quite prominently in these stacks. Uh, I also repeat this process for surface waves. So that was for broadband data. Um, and I also do this for um, LH data. Uh, in this case, it's filtered um, 30 to 200 seconds. These are the verticals. Uh, these are the radials. And this is the one that I really like. It's the, the transverse component. And um, uh, this is a great example of uh, SH multiples, you know, basically forming the love wave package. So the, I, I think a lot of people would agree that these are pretty, but if anybody has any ideas or suggestions what to do with these or a different way to plot them, I'd absolutely welcome that. Oh, and we are working with um, Tari Yunus and Myers. I'm going to get to this next. He actually gave us some spectral element synthetic seismograms, and I repeated the, the, the exact same processing with the 
synthetics is with the data, although unfortunately it's not coming out well in this movie. But his synthetics at that time didn't have attenuation, although they do have attenuation now. So um, we'll clean that up, and I think the interesting thing will be to compare the data stacks to the synthetic stacks with various attenuation models to see what is and isn't showing up uh, at these very late times uh, coming from the core. Um, speaking of synthetics, we do now host uh, the Shake Movie synthetics coming out of the Princeton group. Um, we host the 1D and 3D version. They've made synthetics for uh, th up to over 3,000 events now, and they're backfilling backwards in time, and they're they're basically gone. F uh, done every GCMT event from present back to June of 2009, and they're still continuing backwards. Uh, and they're very easy to access. So for example, this is me just copying and pasting the fetch fetch data command, and the only difference is, is that in this case I requested data, and so I use the network II and the channel LHZ, and in the synthetic case I requested network SY and channel MXZ. So MXZ is for the 3D synthetics, LXZ is for the 1D synthetics. Um, and then when you open up those data, uh, you get two seismograms, two different locations, so it's really one seismogram here. Uh, but then you get three seismograms, um, seemingly for the price of one in the synthetics. And what's going on is that um, it's, it's, a challenge, it's a logistical challenge for us with the metadata. So what we do is we'll simply give you back three seismograms when there's a case of many different earthquakes or many different synthetic seismograms in our database, in our archive that have overlapping uh, traces. So there were, after following the Tohoku earthquake, there were aftershocks very close in time. They still calculated synthetics for each of these events, so there's overlapping data. When you request a time window that has overlapping data, we will return you every seismogram. So it's incumbent upon the user to look at the SAC header or the SAC start time to know which event which event seismogram you're looking at. Okay, uh, I'm close to wrapping up, and now we're going to get into the fun stuff. Um, this is a really big project working with Tari and Myers, who was at Zurich but is now at Oxford. He has 3D axisymmetric uh, seismograms, a seismogram code, axisem. Um, it now includes attenuation and anisotropy. And the goal that we're working towards is producing a complete database uh, of all possible Green's functions. So the end goal, the end result will be you will be able to get a seismogram from any source location to any receiver location on the Earth. Uh, and we hope to do this for many different reference models, so PREM AK-135, PREM Oceanic, PREM Continental, but also PREM Oceanic with different depth layer, water depth layers. Uh, and we don't know exactly how what the how it's going to be delivered, but uh, we're hoping to have a web service set up, basically where just like the data, you can use your command line and you can customize your synthetics and get it straight to your terminal. And of course, we're aware that people will want uh, filtering convolution with the GCMT or an arbitrarily input focal mechanism, and we're working towards that. I don't want to promise too much because it hasn't been done yet, um, but I think this is really exciting, and I think basically this will allow seismologists to uh, fiddle and see the effects of various uh, sources, source effects, model effects, attenuation. So anyway, that's I, I, I'm really hopeful for this project. Um, just a show you how popular our stuff is. Uh, we've shipped out quite a few stuff, although unfortunately we can't uh, determine, uh, you know, there's this problem of uh, there are robots out there. A lot of them come from certain countries which download <laughs> a lot of our products over and over again, or they seem to hit our website every day. So a lot of these numbers are inflated. Take them with a grain of salt. However, um, we do notice that the uh, Back projections, in particular, the USRA GMVs tend to be our most popular product in terms of publicity. All right, and this is a neat little plot that we made, which sort of shows the frequency band of seismology that we're covering with our products. And we're 
absolutely open for new products. We haven't broken into the regional seismology world yet, and we'd love to. So if anybody out there listening has ideas for what would make a good product to serve that community, we'd love to hear from you. So now the fun stuff. So this is plotting uh, noise. This is plotting uh, background noise uh, <laughs> before and during Hurricane Sandy. So these different panels represent different components. Over here is the pressure component, LDF. This is vertical, horizontal. And we made a new movie of this. And if you just go to the Iris web page, we actually synced it up to music. But this is just background noise going on. And as you see Hurricane Sandy coming up, um, it'll increase because the microseism noise got really loud as the storm intensified. Um, this sort of uh, isoseism of strong noise, you'll see it waxes and wanes across US array. So it's, you can say that it's relatively weak. The storm intensifies here, likely, generating strong microseism energy. And strong there, and then it weakens. Uh, and you may have noticed uh, there's also this produced the Frankenstorm that uh, dumped a lot of snow across New York. But you can actually see that uh, coming from the Great Lakes region across US Array. Um, earlier. This is all documented on the website uh, and it shows you what frames to look for. Uh, another cool thing that uh, we did, Manoush did this uh, recently, was for the Gulf of California there are uh, there were about six earthquakes that were very close to each other. So what he did is he stitched together all the GMVs from different time periods and made what we call a super GMV. So in any given time US Array will only span you know, maybe from here out to the coast, but if you stitch them across time and you basically fudge the headers, um, you can make this super GMB, which is really pretty. Oh, and the cool thing about the synthetic seismogram project that we're going to have on demand, you can calculate, or you can request uh, a seismogram for anywhere on the Earth, so you'll be able to create these anywhere you want. Um, it doesn't even have to be on land. You can just make up your own station. So you could request seismograms at every uh, 0.1 degree grid spacing across the planet. So this is, <laughs> now we're going to get to something really fun. So this, we also have SciSound. This is a contributed product. Um, we do this sort of by hand and one off. This is the only one that we do that. Um, Whenever there's a significant event, we'll choose an appropriate seismogram that makes a nice sonification. So this is, you should turn your speakers up now. So that wobbling are the low frequencies, but and it's a little bit hard to see this in the seismogram. Um, and then the spectrogram down here. This is really fun, Manoush and I actually this morning. We, uh, I made this movie and we decided to combine two products. So I made the movie and then he, he had the idea, the brilliant idea of adding uh, the sound to it. So what this is, is this is taking that sonogram and it's um, making it the background music for this combined GMV. So this is a Sea of Okhotsk event. On the left is the verticals and on the right is the horizontals. We just put it on our website this morning, so if, if anybody can't hear it and wants to hear it, um, just go to this website right there and you can download the movie. Okay, cool. I'll link that through the webinar page as well. Thanks. And I think I hit my mark on time. Perfect. So uh, that means you're done? Yep. Excellent. Well, thanks. Uh, well, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, does anybody in the audience have any questions? If you do, uh, feel free to type them into the chat window. 
And uh, I, I had a question about the mechanics of uh, contributed data products. What's the general process for how that goes? And, and if somebody is interested in producing one of these, how long does it take to turn around and sort of end up on SPUD? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, if they go through the proposal process, uh, the in the past, those proposals, the requests for proposals have come out once a year. Uh, and then within weeks or a few months, the DPWG reviewed them. And I'm not sure how quick the funding went out. But uh, in terms of a, something that somebody wants to contribute and just sort of use our large bullhorn um, and sort of spread the good message of their research, um, or share their research, I should say. To put it into SPUD will would probably take of order weeks or a few months, depending on uh, how how if we can if it's a relatively simple thing to present, it should be. I can't make any promises, but in the past, it's been uh, weeks to months. Okay, it goes through the vetting process of the DPWG. We don't actually say yes or no to anything. It's the DPWG that decides. Right. Yep. That's an important point. Um, okay. Well, I have a couple questions. Uh, one is from Casey Aderhold, and Casey's asking, what is what was the timeline for the database for the greens functions? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a million dollar question. Um, so, uh, in order to calculate that, I mean that that terabase that database we're expecting is going to be over six terabytes, and it's probably going to take millions of CPU hours. And uh, we don't know. There's still some code development going on. And then, in addition to that, um, it's it's not us that's running that. It's an external collaborator. So um, that's a big. Uh, I can't answer that. And but we will certainly announce it when it happens. Okay. A uh, question from Lisa Wald. Uh, for your event-based web pages, such as uh, slash spud slash event 439987, how is that ID and the URL determined? Is it predictable? Uh, yeah, so no, it is not. Um, so these, uh, those IDs, the Iris internal event IDs, are just determined when we get an event, so they're not predictable. They're internal Iris event IDs. And then the SPUD has its own IDs. So yes, uh, I understand the confusion with the weird numbers uh, at the end of links. So uh, yeah, sorry. They don't mean anything. Does uh, anybody else out there have a question? want to make sure that there's nobody who's still typing something in. Well, Casey says thank you for your answer on the uh, greens functions. For my non-answer? Yes. Um, all right. Well, if, uh, if anybody else has any questions, I imagine they're, they're free to contact uh, you, Alex, or is there a better... Sure. Okay. Uh, product at product at Iris or Alex at Iris at Washington at Edu. Any one of us really. We're a small organization. Right. Okay. Well. Um. Well, I want to thank you, Alex, again, uh, and the rest of the folks at the DMC for uh, being available to do this. I think it was really informative. Uh, I certainly learned a couple things, and I work for Iris, so that's always a good thing. Um. Yeah, so folks out there, this is going to be archived and up on the web uh, shortly. I'll include a link to the SciSound page and some of the other uh, information that was presented on this. And uh, like I said, I will uh, uh, update on the next webinar within a week or two of when it will be presented. And I hope to see lots of you back here throughout the fall. So, uh, Alex, thanks again. And uh, thanks, talk you. to you all again soon. Thanks for listening, everybody.